If this was a movie trailer, it might sound like... Imagine a world where you could hear your dog's thoughts, feelings, and deepest desires, all with the push of a button. Hey, human. I know you work hard, but I've been running the numbers, and the chicken deliverables are looking pretty slim this month, so pick up the pace or I'll have to get corporate involved. But it's not a movie trailer. It's a podcast. Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Olivia Bradley in Seattle, Washington, back again for another episode of Dog Edition, where voices from around the world consider all things dog. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's go for a walk, because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? We are talking about the dog buttons that have made internet stars out of huskies and sheepadoodles alike. You've probably seen some of the baffling videos of dogs who seem to be communicating some pretty complex ideas and thoughts with these little recordable buttons. Olivia, it's great to have you back on Dog Edition. Well, thank you for having me back again, Jim. I am so excited and because we're talking about something that really came up in one of our team meetings where I asked you how your Christmas was and what you got from Christmas, and you said you got buttons to make conversation with your dogs. That's right, yeah. Honestly, she has taken to it very well. And and Friday is your your dog, How, how she's a puppy, how old is she? She's about 10 months old. Okay. And what's the thing that has surprised you the most in addition to how quickly she's learning it? Oh, gosh. She always tries to play with the cat. She's not allowed to, but she really wants to. Mm -hmm. So the other day, she saw the cat and she ran over to her buttons, smacked the play button, and then did a big leaping pounce in the direction of the cat. And I've heard her downstairs pushing the play button when it's just her and Casper, my other dog, in the room. So she's using the button seemingly to like communicate oh my. to the yeah, to the other animals in the house, which is crazy. That is so extraordinary. And that's why we are gonna be talking all about listening to and talking with your dogs using these buttons on today's episode. Well, we will talk more about your own experiences later in the episode, but to get us started, I wanted to find out more about the the business side of this, because there is a business component to these buttons that are going everywhere. So I spoke with Leo Trottier. He is the CEO of one of the companies that makes these buttons. It's called Clever Pet, and he's the brains behind what seems to be everyone's favorite dog button system. Yeah. I've always loved animals, and I mean, we really do think of ourselves almost as like a cognitive science company, if that makes sense. Fluent Pet is a system of hex tiles. There are these kind of pads that are hexagonal. They are puzzle pieces that connect together, and in them, you can put sound buttons. So when you press them, out comes a word that you've recorded into them. The person who really popularized this was uh, Christina Hunger. She herself was a speech-language pathologist helping children who had linguistic development difficulties communicate using what would be called AAC, augmentative and assistive communication devices. She found that the techniques that worked for these children ended up working for her dog, Stella. And she started an Instagram account and it got extremely popular in the fall of 2019. And a a bunch of other people were inspired by her. All these people, this is all DIY. They were improvising these devices. They were buying things of plywood from Home Depot and like Velcro off Amazon and organizing them often in these like just plain square grids where each of the buttons was kind of indistinguishable. Let me tell you a little bit about Leo's background and how all of this started for him. You see, Leo had already developed a product that merged the worlds of canine cognitive science and product design. The Clever Pet Hub was the world's first game console for dogs. He had this ability to build consumer products for for pet lovers. But when he started seeing the popularity of all these people on the internet doing things with buttons, he knew he could come up with a better way, put a little bit of science into it. Let's let him explain. I said, hey, like, why don't you organize them in a little bit of a systematic way? You can use what's called a Fitzgerald key, named after this woman around 100 years ago. She was trying to help people who are deaf or hard of hearing communicate, and she would organize concepts into a grid 
where each part of speech kind of had its own square. So you'd have subject words, object words, greeting words, like, hello. And it worked, right? We started working with these people who had achieved all this success to try and give them better tools. We gave them prototypes. And one of the people we gave them to was this one woman, Alexis Devine. She uh, has the dog, Bunny, whom probably many of your listeners might be familiar with. <laughs> we'll walk tomorrow morning. Yes. No. Because we're all done walk. We're all done walk. Okay. Okay, let me put on some shoes. I love that. You know, as a dog lover, I'm going to say, of course the dog totally knew what was going on and was finally having the vocabulary to express herself. But not everyone thinks that's as simple as that. And there are a lot of skeptics out there, aren't there? Honestly, I was skeptical um, when I first saw it. Wait, you were skeptical? Is that why you got the buttons for Christmas? Okay, I have been pretty well convinced, to be honest with you. There's some very, very compelling anecdotal evidence. I guess my skepticism lies in the fact that, like, we could be misreading what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Well, Leo Trottier is uh, is an academic. He started out all of this because he was studied behavioral science, psychology in, in university. And here's his take on these criticisms. We all bring some amount of skepticism about what's going on. What the dogs actually mean when they're pressing the buttons, that's a very hard thing to figure out. If a dog says, love you, what does that actually mean, right? The people that we're working with, they are skeptical themselves. They, they express their own alternative hypotheses, but nonetheless, they're still fascinated. There are so many of these really powerful anecdotes. We've seen a dog who really likes ice cubes who knew the word for bone and who knew the word for water, say water bone, and then expect an ice cube. Olivia, water bone, <laughs> you think it was real. I have to tell you, I'm going to be calling them water bones from now on because <laughs> I also have dogs that like ice cubes. <laughs> the most convincing part of this to me is seeing these dogs being very creative with which words they pair together to convey some sort of meaning. It, it's It's fascinating. Bunny will sometimes do things consistently that are very puzzling. And so we're engaged in almost like a cryptographic kind of, we're trying to decrypt what it is that Bunny's trying to communicate to Alexis. At least that's what it feels like. I mean, we don't, who knows, again. Bunny was pressing sound walk or sound tug. And this would be at the beginning of an interaction. Then whenever Alexis would offer to take Bunny on a walk, Bunny was like, no, no, I don't want to walk. Or she'd offer the tug to Bunny and Bunny would act frustrated and like huff and then like, go away. And we're like, well, maybe Bunny is asking to use the board. It's like Bunny's asking to talk. So Alexis introduced a talk button. Bunny stops saying sound walk, sound tug, and starts beginning conversations with come talk. So Bunny is obviously a really, really clever dog. I mean, I love the fact that, you know, she just doesn't have enough vocabulary, so we just create more and more buttons. But is this real, Olivia? <laughs> you started to, to reach out to some academics who are looking into this to, to get their take. What did you find out? Well, so I do want to be clear that this is not being studied yet. But I, I did speak with a scientist, Zach Silver, at the Canine Cognition Center at Yale. I think it's great that Yale prestigious institution has a center for canine cognition. It must be that uh, dogs are really smart, right? Well, I asked Zach about that specifically. I think there's a lot of nuance to the question of just how intelligent dogs are. Maybe a different way of framing that question that will allow us to understand it more completely is to ask in what ways dogs are smart. Because dogs really do show some very sophisticated cognitive abilities in the specific domains in which they have the right skill set to demonstrate that intelligence. And that seems largely to be the social cognition domain. And that seems to be the area in which they are most intelligent. And that makes perfect sense given their evolutionary history. There's really no other animal that had the same process of living alongside us and working collaboratively with us for this very, very long duration of time. We shaped dogs to understand us. 
So that's all great background. And what I've gathered is that dogs do share a lot of similarities to humans socially. And I guess where that leads me is thinking about language. And language is maybe our human species most unique ability, wouldn't you say? I would think so. Yeah. There's a lot of words that we are able to use to communicate our thoughts. And language is pretty important to us humans. Right. And I can't think of another critter out there that uses language in the same way that we do. So I asked Zach straight up what he thought about these buttons when he saw this trend pop up. Anytime I see something in pop culture that is about dogs, I always try to approach it through a scientific perspective and try to understand what's going on there. And I would say a vast majority of the time, what we're seeing when we see these social media trends with dogs pop up is something that really isn't all that scientifically relevant to us. It's usually something that is just, uh, well, this is a dog who has been trained to do something very specific that isn't actually all that interesting. And maybe the human kind of inadvertently cued their dog to do a certain thing in response to some communication that they give. But also, we don't know, you know did, how often did they rehearse this very short video that we're seeing. Now, actually, in this particular case with these AAC buttons, I think there's something far more interesting going on here. We talked a lot earlier about all the ways in which dogs are able to interpret communication that comes from us. And that's sort of what they had been domesticated to do. They've been domesticated to learn from us, to communicate with us in a way that is sometimes uni unilateral, where they're getting this communication from us, sort of a one-way stream there. So this AAC experiment now that's occurring is a very interesting way for us to get better insights into just how effectively dogs are able to produce their own communication as opposed to receiving communication from us. I love it when a scientist goes, huh, there may be something to that. Okay, so if the CEO of the company that makes the button acknowledges the validity of the skepticism, Certainly, Zach, the Yale scientist, has some criticism of it as well. You know, I actually wouldn't say that he had criticism, per se, but absolutely skepticism. Mm. And that's just the nature of science, right? That's what makes science valid. Yeah. You know, I have seen people in the comments in some of these videos claiming there's no way this is real. Mm. And I think it's important to remember that skepticism is not about denouncing the validity of something. It's about leaving room for a multitude of possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. We just don't know what's happening here because it hasn't been studied yet. And so Zach laid out a few ways in which we could be potentially off base with the assumption that our dogs are using language to communicate. One way of thinking about communication is a rich, deep network of various associations. And that isn't the way that humans use language. Humans use language in a, a capacity that's far more generative. I could say something right now that has never been said before, and you would understand what I'm saying because we have this common vocabulary of words that we are able to use. Associative communication, you know, outside the, being the button or the sound that the button makes, and then the concept of outside, um, we don't necessarily know that dogs are using that linguistically at all. It could just be an association between the button, the sound, and then the reward. If I press this pattern of buttons, I get a favorable result from the human. Um, and it could be as simple as that. And it may be the case that it is you know, far more complex than that. These uh, things that we're seeing popping up in the kind of trending space on the internet, they're very interesting and thought provoking, but more so as a fodder for what might be an experiment that we could then use to verify these ideas. The point that I want to really drive home is that we just don't know. So does Zach have a dog? Well, I also asked him about that. I do. Anyway, I have a dog here in New Haven, Connecticut with me. Um, she's uh, a dog we actually got during the pandemic. She is definitely a dog who pays a lot of attention to communication uh, and is a great pattern learner. She definitely has cycles of behaviors that she exhibits that she knows will get a certain reaction out of me. Um, and I think it could be the case that when we're talking about AAC buttons, dogs are doing something just like that, just in a, in a slightly different context. I don't want to be overly deflationary of this because I really do think there's something interesting with these buttons. I think there's room for exploration. So I want to know, would he use the buttons himself? I pushed a little bit further. I definitely would. I, as a scientist, as a scientist who studies dogs, I'm very interested in these buttons. So I don't want to come across as though I'm someone who thinks that the, the buttons are, are not useful for us. I think they're very interesting. And I would love to be able to get that firsthand experience with them. I think if it becomes more 
widely available, I would certainly be interested in trying it with my dog. Okay, so he is rightly skeptical as a scientist at Yale. He may get the button someday. We're going to take a break right now, but when we come back, some real life experiences from people who are using these buttons with their dogs and getting some extraordinary things. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Oh, every day with you is like a day at the beach, and I want as many beach days as possible. Oh, I want to run. I want to sniff. Ooh, I want to find a good stick to carry. Oh, I want to roll in the grass. Oh, and warm my belly in the sun. Oh, I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want ever pop. The green, glassy beef liver smell wakes my senses. Oh, you may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy. It infuses any food you give me with healthy life vibrancy. Oh, I can feel it. Ever pop traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. I'm so grateful to be your dog and for the ever pop you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. Welcome back to Dog Edition. So let's hear from some people who are using these AAC buttons with their dogs. Yeah, I spoke to Shell. Uh, You may know her as Shell Lexi Husky on Instagram. She's been using these buttons for about a year with her dog, Lexi, and documenting the progress on social media. Lexi, what? Let me... Lexi, thank you. <laughs> well, come here. Happy. This is Lexi. She's eight years old now. Yesterday was her birthday. I um, started this channel because I'm someone who struggles with chronic illness, and I was just looking for something that would distract me because I was in a kind of depressed state. So I started looking at Bunny, and Bunny was just so talented. This is when she was like looking in the mirror and saying like, who's this? Who dog? And I'm like, what? This is so bananas. So I was like, maybe I could do this with Lexi. Lexi picked up on it really fast. You'd think they're not listening to you. They're totally listening. They're always listening to you, just like kids. It's just been incredible. It's like having somebody to talk to when you're really going through something tough. One thing I thought was really cool was that Lexi was actually able to use the buttons to communicate to Shell that she needed medical attention. She has sensitive paws, and so I would put salve on her paws often and say, ouch, so she knows this is why we do that. And I had just pretty much introduced that concept. So when she said, ouch, mom, I'm just like, "Mm, I just taught you that button. You're just repeating what I'm saying, right? Because it's a first step. I'm not going to take it that seriously. But then she said it again, and she said, ouch, help. And I'm like, hmm, okay, this there might be something to this. So we ended up taking her in, and that's when we found out that she had pancreatitis. And that's a condition that causes a lot of pain. And so she was trying to tell me, like, lady, I'm in pain, <laughs> and I'm just happy that I took it seriously. <laughs> Mommy, oh, ouch, yes. Please. Yeah, I'll help. I'd say that's probably the coolest thing, is her being able to tell me that she was hurt. The dog now has the vocabulary to say, I need to go to the vet. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, amazing. And just thinking about what doors that opens up for us as dog people, right? Mm Mm-hmm. 
One thing I saw in some of Shell's videos was that she will actually use the board to ask Lexi for consent when she has to perform certain care-related tasks that she knows are not Lexi's favorites. Oh my gosh. Lexi hates being brushed. Like, I don't know why she does, but she hates being brushed. Every time I brush her, after we're done, she'll go over and she'll hit mad. (laughs) And she'll be mad, like, for the rest of the day. Like, all of our conversations revolve around brushing and brush mad. (laughs) So I started it with, well, maybe she needs me to ask her first. One day I'm like, mom brushed Lexi and waited for her to tell me yes or no. She said no, (laughs) but that's fine. I waited. And then later on, I asked her again and she said, good girl, which is yes. uh, in Lexi speak. (laughs) And she was fine. She didn't say that she was mad after that. So that's where it started with, well, maybe she just wants me to ask her first. So let me ask her before I give her her medicine. Let me ask her before I do this. And then maybe she'll you know, take to it better. And she did. I I love this. And in like the dog training community, we call this cooperative care. The idea is that we don't force our dogs to do training sessions if they aren't feeling it because we want them to have positive associations with the things that we want them to do. My dogs are never going to love having their nails clipped, but I have the cooperative care system that works for us. Really? What do you do? They can have a Kong with something yummy in it, maybe some peanut butter, as long as I have a paw in my hand. Uh And they are allowed to pull their paw away at any time, and I will stop clipping their nails, but the peanut butter then goes away. Oh, the Kong goes away. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. It's a trade-off, right? But they get to be willing participants, and I just think if we can work together to make that experience better, it's actually easier for me that way, too. So now I just need to figure out a way to get a button to explain to Kanga that we're going to do her anal glands. Oh, no. (laughs) We see there may be be some limitations. Right. Well, on that note, there might be some things that, like, are not worth the peanut butter (laughs) to the dog, right? (laughs) That could be. Yeah. They don't ultimately have a choice. So I I asked Shell um, what she does if Lexi says no to her medicine. I just wait a couple minutes. <laughs> she's kind of like a like a kid in that way. Like maybe not right now because she's maybe she was already trying to go play and you just interrupted her. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just give it a moment and then come back to it and try again. And maybe she just doesn't understand that she needs to take the medicine. You know what I'm saying? Like at one point she had to have the subcutaneous fluids. Oh my gosh, she hated that. And I hated doing it. But I think what it was is she didn't understand that this is trying to help you. Once she started to feel better and feel the effects of the fluids and her not being dehydrated anymore, this is just my perception, (laughs) that she's kind of drawing those conclusions that, okay, this, now I feel okay. I totally get it. I actually think when it comes to medicine, dogs sometimes can really understand that it doesn't taste very good. It's not very fun to get it. But they feel better. And if they get it enough times, they're feeling better. They're drawing the association between, hey, these untasty meds do make me feel better. Totally. That is what Zach was talking about earlier, is that dogs are incredible associative learners. And so it makes sense that they would be able to tell that the medicine makes them feel better. I think about other things that are maybe harder to communicate to my dog, that maybe the buttons could be a way to bridge that communication gap. Like fireworks are not the literal end of the world. Mm -hmm. Like if I could just tell them that, if they could just know that everything's going to be totally fine, that would be pretty revolutionary. That would be revolutionary. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, that's a big dream. And it sounds a little bit wacky. And Shell is definitely no stranger to the skepticism either. And How do you know that they're not just pushing that button to get that reaction? You start to get patterns. You know when your dog is pulling your leg or (laughs) is, is actually saying something with meaning, with purpose. I would say... We know because they're like our kids. And um, Lexi still makes mistakes all the time. Lexi still battles. The way I know if it's real is I look at context clues. I look at patterns and how she normally puts words together. And I just know from being around her all the time and knowing her as a person or as a dog. (laughs) But I welcome skepticism. (laughs) And I welcome your analysis. And I welcome you guys to tell me, is she just 
making nonsense words together or is she meaning something by it? The most interesting thing about this trend to me is when dogs seem to be using these buttons creatively to communicate about something that they don't have a button for yet. She put water and walk together and she kept saying water walk and I'm like, what are you talking about? And I just kind of, I won't say I ignored it, but I kind of was like, okay. But it took a couple of different instances of her saying water walk and going to the door for me to realize she means rain. So that's when I added the rain button. And then since she has the rain button, she doesn't say water walk anymore. So to me, that means that she meant water walk to mean rain. And we heard some other stories from Leo, one in particular about Bunny that sticks with me. Again, we don't really know what's going on, but Bunny was repeatedly pressing some combination of buttons that were very difficult to discern. Night talk sleep, or night sleep talk, or night talk. What is going on, Bunny? This is, of course, after the introduction of the talk button. And we were like, is Bunny talking about dreams? And we're like, no, that's that cannot be. One of our researchers actually proposed, when Bunny's dreaming, like, wake her up and ask Bunny what, what's going on. What talk sleep? What talk sleep? When sleep, what talk, Bunny? Hmm? Stranger animal? Were you dreaming about a stranger animal? This is probably opens up a whole fertile ground for, you know, dream analysis of dogs. I would definitely listen to a dog dream interpretation podcast <laughs> if I could. <laughs> maybe coming soon from Dog Podcast Network. Maybe later in the year. Okay, so inquiring minds want to know. We've we've heard about Bunny and we've heard about Lexi. Let's get into your dog Friday. Good morning. You want to go out? Friday. Use your words. Outside? Yeah, okay, let's go outside. Yeah. It sounds like it's going pretty well. Right now, I have just a few buttons. Like Leo was saying, I had to kind of come up with a really makeshift DIY situation. So you cobbled it together. That's cool. Yeah, it's not very dog proof and uh, it's kind of slipping and sliding all over the place. But nevertheless, she seems to be really taken to them very well. She got the outside button down within an hour mm -hmm. and I added a play button, which we're working from home. She's now incessantly asking us to come play with her. <laughs> You want to play? Okay, let's play. Play tug. And then I, I also added a snuggle button, which was kind of an interesting experiment because I figure if all of the buttons are the same or if she's confused or if she doesn't fully understand what's going on, she would be using all of the buttons equally right? But she doesn't use the snuggle button, which to me means it's just not something she's all that interested like, in doing. I know what snuggle means. I don't need to communicate that. I love it. Well, this button trend is pretty cool. It's certainly something we will continue to follow here on Dog Podcast Network because I can see a growing interest in buttons. If you have some thoughts and played with buttons yourself, please reach out to us. You can get in contact with us via our website at dogedition.com. That is all for today's episode. Olivia, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having me, Jim. And I want to thank you for hitting that play button and joining us today. If you haven't already, please follow or subscribe to Dog Edition in your favorite podcast player. We are also available on YouTube. And if you like today's episode, please do us a favor by sharing it. Tell a friend or two at the dog park or wherever about Dog Edition. I'm James Jacobson. On behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I want to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Aloha.